Hello everybody. So I am jumping into another live coding session here and uh, if you recall from last week we were uh, well we basically had a pretty good working simulation. Uh, if I run this and fingers crossed that it will behave the same way that it did last time. don't see any good reason that it should fail but yeah so we had this fairly solid simulation of uh, the Earth orbiting the Sun with real like uh, gravitational and scientific values um, all of the the real measurements for mass and distance and um, speed of orbit and all of those things for the Earth and the Sun and uh, this is going very nicely um, with a very large time scale to account for it but so this week we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, I'm not going to focus on um, getting the ob assignment objectives done. This, uh, the previous video already does a pretty good job with covering most of the things that you really need to be able to do. Um, what I'm going to focus on this time around um, is probably going to touch on some of the stuff that Scott has been introducing you to. Um, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time showing you ways that you can um, start to sort of refactor and pick apart your application and turn it into something that uses more like reusable parts. And this will be really helpful um, leading into assignment four, uh, which hasn't come out yet, but um, probably you're going to want to be able to reuse some of the code that, that you've built for this so far. Um, and of course you could do that in other ways but it's nice to be able to just pick up classes and move them um, and then just sort of like make a new one for for whatever uh, whatever really needs to be specialized in the code so what we're gonna do today is talk a little bit about the idea of scenes and making some kind of scene uh, that you can have um, sort of a definition for uh, where um, you'll be able to fill in functions that you know are going to be sort of called regularly like um, in your scene you could define a um, you know some sort of function for um, when the scene starts and when the scene gets updated and you know when an event comes in from SDL uh, and all of those things will sort of be uh, handled uh, by some kind of game manager that's responsible for sort of running things. So a lot of this is going to be kind of getting out of your main because um, right now we have a lot of code in the main and uh, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that for the time being but typically we want to end up in a case where the huge majority of our class or of our code falls into classes that we have defined uh, that sort of like clearly define what our what our program is is going to be uh, so anyway I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and um, I am going to uh, create a new class to start off with I might as well uh, jump right in and uh, just take a look at what I mean by a scene on yes okay so so this scene class is um, <clears throat> it's going to be something um, a little bit different from what we have done so far I'm gonna I'm gonna put a couple variables into this uh, that you probably recognize. Uh, I don't need to import those. Here we go. Good. All right, so. So this scene class, um, starting off with, you'll notice that I have it holding an MVP matrix and a world. Well, why these two things in particular? 
um, for what we're doing, we're what what I mean by a scene here is that I basically mean a scenario where there are game objects and there are um, there is some sort of like world in play where there's um, like objects that you can view and um, things that are happening and maybe some specialized code associated with that space. Um, you may have encountered these in Unity, for example. Of course, Unity has the concept of scenes where you can sort of flip between different Unity scene files and there are uh, things that you can do in the code to switch between scenes in your Unity projects um, when they're running. So we do this because we want to be able to I mean, effectively make like very different spaces for very different things. I mean, uh, in a lot of cases, this may mean that you have a scene for a menu and a scene for level one and a scene for level two and a scene for, I don't know, your scoring screen or something like that. It really depends uh, what you want to make a scene into. Uh, I'm going to stick with a fairly sort of conservative idea that a scene is going to be a place where sort of gameplay happens. So. I'm going with the idea that uh, we have a physics world uh, in every one of these. This is a little bit of a convenience. I mean, you could potentially do this differently, but I've decided to include the world in here because it's just a little bit easier to think about. And secondly, we have an MVP matrix to define how the camera looks into this scene. So this, of course, means that if we load a different scene, we can have a very different camera viewpoint if we want to. Um, <clears throat> for what we're going to do here, we only really need one scene, and uh, there isn't really any need to uh, to go further than that. Um, so this is a little bit for for show and to clean things up. But I want to be able to um, you know give you the idea of like kind of where we're headed with this. Um, so I'm also going to add in, um, again, being good since I made these things protected, um, the MVP matrix in the world are not accessible from outside the class. Oops, that's giving spoilers. Um, I'm also going to include a couple of getters uh, to be able to uh, get the MVP matrix in the world later. Um, it's, not, um, it's not a really big thing. But what I really want to focus on are these. Um, I'm also going to have to include sdl.h for that. Okay, so Scott has probably introduced you to the idea of pure virtual functions, uh, where you have a virtual function which is set equal to zero um, to indicate that this needs to be implemented by a subclass. Uh, in order for this to to sort of exist. This is like a prototype function definition, kind of. Um, so how we are going to be using scene is that when we want to make a scene of our own, in this case, let's say we'll call it assignment three. So assignment three will be inheriting from scene and it will implement these functions in order to um, give code to sort of each one of these these situations. So, I mean, looking them over, you probably have some idea of what these things are intending to do. So, um, probably for most of these, you can correctly guess what they are. So begin is code that should run when the scene starts. End is code that should run when the scene is about to finish. Uh, handle event uh, gets called by SDL to pass in any events that have happened so that if you need to respond to specific SDL events you have the ability to do that. You could use this for example um, for like key presses or potentially mouse events or things like that so there's a lot of options here sort of surrounding input and probably plenty of other things as well but so that's so that's that. You'll note that this one has to take an argument in because you have to pass the event in um, in order for this to be useful. Uh, there's a render function. So render, of course, gets called when you intend to draw the scene to the window um, when, you want to, um, when you want to output something. So that'll happen, of course, frame by frame. And 
and then lastly we have update now so update and render are very sort of closely related so usually it goes that update runs and then render runs after the update is finished like basically that's how that goes and of course update is what we would expect update to be that it takes in a delta time and we can do whatever we need to do to uh, modify our simulation handle any gameplay code that's going on um, possibly like process um, controls or AI actions or who knows what all kinds of things could go in there tons of stuff um, and um, I'm gonna put in oh let's just go ahead and do this I don't know what this would look like if I don't do this oops I missed a line so I'm also going to have this uh, game manager uh, you're noticing probably me point this out um, I mentioned this earlier and I'm also going to do a kind of funky thing here uh, Scott may have introduced you to this concept um, I'm not sure this um, class it seems really strange right like I'm it looks like I begin defining a class and then I just cap it off with a semicolon. Like, why am I doing that? Um, so what this is about is this is a statement to the C++ compiler to say that um, there exists a class called Game Manager out there somewhere. It's probably not defined yet, but chill, it's okay. Something called Game Manager exists in the world somewhere and eventually that will be defined and it's okay but for now I just need you to know that this class exists because if you know that you also know that pointers to a class of that kind exists so of course you're asking why would you do that like every other time that we do this we just write include uh, I'm surprised that this is not picking up on that uh, include game manager dot h why is it having problems with this oh because I don't have that yet okay so let's define that first so that we don't have any problems okay so all right we now have a game manager class it's enough to to make this work so yeah of course so somebody out there is asking well, why not just include it this is complicated, but the reason for this <clears throat> is something called a circular dependency. Um, most languages that you have run into, you have never encountered this because most more modern programming languages uh, do a pretty good job in their import system or their include system or whatever it is that you use to like sort of include new code at protecting themselves from having this kind of circular inclusion nonsense happen. But I know uh, when I put my game manager together, I'm going to end up with something that looks a little bit like this. <clears throat> um, let me just throw in some statements here that I know I'm going to be including up top. Um, so, there's an interesting situation going on here. Um, if I want scene in here, notice that I have a scene pointer here. Now if I want to be able to use scene for things, generally you have to include scene.h. Now, the lesson that I have to teach here is a very tiny one um, but so scene this this scene pointer doesn't necessarily need this include you could also do something like this but what I want to point to is that let's say you have an include for scene in here and this goes okay so I'm loading game manager uh, I need to go get scene.h so that I can use scene in here and okay that seems perfectly sensible so I'm the compiler let's say and we're gonna go over to scene.h and read scene.h and see what it tells us about 
what it needs in order to exist. So we hop over here and I start running down through lines and I go, okay, I'm going to include SDL and then you hit this include game manager dot H. Well, okay, so let's go to game manager dot H and load that. So we go back over here and then we start counting down through and then we find scene dot H and then we go over here and then we see game manager and then we go over here and we see scene and game manager and scene and game manager and scene and game manager until the compiler gets sick. Um, so there is a way that we can avoid this in situations this this particularly will tend to show up in situations where you end up with a pattern like where game manager happens to have a scene or a pointer to scene within it and then the scene has some sort of pointer to game within it um, where they sort of point back and forth to one another you need a way to be able to break this circle um, so what I'm doing with this is that <clears throat> by using a pointer inside scene here to say that I only need a pointer to game manager uh, I can actually do a tiny little bit less than having to include it turns out that as long as you are only stating that you need pointers for things and you never call any functions on game or anything like that you are just holding on to a pointer to it in this .h file, you can simply say class game manager, and that will say to the compiler, there is a class called game manager out there somewhere. It might not be defined right now, and I don't really need to know the details. I just need to know that it's possible to have a pointer to a type called game manager. And by doing that, I no longer need this include and then when this thing goes on and it reads down through, okay, go get me scene so that I can do that. We go over to scene and we have no problems. This thing, if game manager is already put together, like we're fine and game manager will just be like the pointer to it will just be addressed normally. Everything's cool. Um, now I had this written slightly differently um, inside here. Um, I guess I was protecting myself even further because I know that I have a scene pointer in here as well. So I can in fact knock out the include there too. So this leaves me with a situation where neither side really needs to directly include the other. Um, so I should note also that this is a situation that tends to happen between .h files. .cpp files don't really suffer from the same problems because cpp files um, basically just include their headers. The headers are the things that really link things together. Um, <clears throat> but um, for example, um, why would I ever want, uh, the reason that I want to talk about CPP files is why would I ever want to deal with just a scene pointer? Like what good is it if I just hold on to a pointer and I literally never do anything with it? I don't call any functions on it or anything like that. I mean, it's basically useless if all I can do is have it and I can't do anything to it. Um, so, I mean, if you're a particularly astute person, you may have thought about that and go like, well, why, why would I hold on to something that I can't do anything with? Um, well, so this goes one sort of step deeper here. Um, so let's say that I want to be able to do something. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to look for a place where I can sort of make good use of this. Um, I might just invent something for the moment. So what I can do here is that if I need to do something with a game manager, I can add the include to the CPP. Now you're saying, well, but now you have the include back. Like that's, that's bad. But remember that CPP files include dot h files it's not the other way around when a cpp file gets run it goes and fetches its header i want you to notice that carefully because this thing can include game manager and then go fetch the scene but if something else needs the scene header that game manager include isn't in there and it can't cause 
a circular inclusion. It is safer to include things in your CPP file sort of underneath than it is to include um, into the H file directly. So my feelings on this are basically like, um, and I'm going to try and use this sort of going forward, although so far I've been pretty loose about using includes in class, but I'm going to try and, and do this in sort of the ideal way, is that basically if you can get away with it, use a forward include. That's sort of the ideal thing that if, if you only need the ability to hold a pointer to something in your H file, use, the, use a forward include. If you really, really need to do more with it in here, then you can include it properly. But if you can get away with just having the like important specifics of um, what a game manager does or whatever thing you're trying to include does in your CPP, include it there. So um, basically, ideally include things in your CPP if possible. And again, ideally use forward includes if possible. Um, when you have a problem with this, uh, you will almost always find it in the form of a nasty linker error. Um, let me see if I can just try to get this to, to link doing it the bad way. <laughs> Let's see. So I'll just, um, I'll put these in here and I'll see if I can get this project to compile. See what it looks like. Because it gives you a very ugly looking thing. Or it's like very difficult to. Uh, that isn't what I expected, but. Oh, I don't have a. That constructor to find. Or destructor. Okay, so I'll try this one more time. I'm a little bit impressed that managed to build this may have more problems at runtime ah there we go okay so I had to actually take the circular include or the um, forward include way um, so you get errors that tend not to make a whole lot of sense so you see these things like syntax error identifier game manager, like the errors that you get from C++ surrounding doing this are really hard to understand. Like you look at them and you don't see why it's telling you that. And frankly, it takes a little bit of experience to be able to identify what the problem really is here and deal with it. So, um, this is why I warn you and why I'm showing you what this looks like. Um, because the first time, the first 10 times this happens to you, you're probably going to go, but that's not happening. That's not really an error. Like, compiler, you're wrong. Why, why are you doing this to me? Um, and uh, that, that starts to be a sign uh, that some sort of circular inclusion is happening here. So if I strip this away... And, uh, oops, there we go. And I'll get rid of this. Okay, so we're just down to having uh, forward includes that are handling this. And I'm going to try compiling this. And everything goes swimmingly. Despite the fact that I even have Game Manager included here. And... Uh, in fact, inside Game Manager, I would have seen included here, so I could even do this both ways, and it's fine. It's perfectly good. So, um, if you want to be proficient with C++, um, <clears throat> one moment, how do I switch that to be not disturb mode? Uh, I frankly don't know. Okay, well, whatever. Um, yeah, so this is this is going to be a very helpful trick 
uh, for you if you want to be very proficient with C++. Uh, being able to do this saves you many problems, I guarantee you. So anyway, um, that was a little bit of a detour. I realize that that's, you know, um, probably a fair amount of time that we sort of spent on that. But this is a really important and sometimes really, really um, confusing problem. So I wanted to, I wanted to sort of address that. Scott may have talked about it, but I wanted to sort of show you in my own way uh, because it's an important one for you to understand. Um, I have one more thing that I missed in here that I just wanted to throw in. So this is our whole scene um, as this is structured. Like, so I wanted to point out here that I have this initialize and these constructors set up here. Um, like most things, most classes that I've put together uh, for SDL here, I have an init. So the reason that I do this is so that if I want to create a scene not as a pointer, like, and it gets automatically constructed, I might not be able to like initialize it right when my program starts. I might only be able to do that at a later time. So I pretty much always include this initialize function. That being said though, sometimes I can actually initialize something right when I create it. So I like to make a constructor that just calls the init function because um, it, it just makes it easy to get my class started here. So <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is you know what I think I'm just gonna paste this stuff right in and then we'll, we'll look over some of the details of what this CPP actually does so basically I'm just starting from the top these things are the properties that I would put together here so I've got a game manager pointer to game I've got this MVP matrix and I've got my world um, you'll notice that these properties don't return things exactly as they are um, the game pointer uh, gets returned as a pointer, but I return a reference to the MVP matrix because otherwise I wouldn't, like if I, if I get the MVP matrix outside of this and I need to modify it, I need a reference to make sure that the matrix is actually modifying the one that's inside here and not making a copy of it to uh, be modified elsewhere. And I'm returning a world pointer here, again, because I want to be able to refer to this world and not make a copy of the world to be sent to somewhere else. So um, anyway, these are the ways that I'm making my private or my protected things visible. Um, so the next two things are constructors, right? So the first one, all it needs to do is set game to no. Um, because I have that game pointer, I want to make sure that that game pointer is set to null um, unless I, uh, I set it to something else. Um, you'll notice that I'm not doing anything to set world or MVP matrix uh, because neither of these things are pointers. They're being automatically constructed, um, which means that I can count on them to initialize themselves uh, without any problems. That's, that's all that's going on there. Of course, I have the other constructor, which takes my game manager pointer in. So this is the one that automatically initializes. So as you can see, I'm just calling initialize. Um, I also seem to have a couple problems here with um, some things that are expecting window. Uh, what is the issue here? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, I think I have some idea what's going on. Um, game, game manager is mostly not defined yet, so um, this get window function probably doesn't actually exist yet. Um, do I actually? I must. Sorry, give me one moment to sort of look over my own code and make sure that I'm not going nuts. Okay, yeah, I'm good. Uh, yeah, so lastly, um, we have in the game manager here, um, yeah, like this is enough of the scene. You'll notice that the scene is very simple, really, right? Like all I'm basically doing in initialize here is that I'm setting the game to what we passed in and I'm going through and um, setting up like a default orthographic camera view um, for the device. That's it. 
um, the game is going to have access to the window. So the game is where um, the window and the clock reside because the window and the game clock are things that um, are sort of... Um, they're above the level of scenes in my understanding here. Like the game clock, clock begins running the instant that you start running the game and whether a scene is displaying or not or which scene is showing or whatever, um, that game clock sort of is ticking throughout that whole process. Um, and window here um, is, of course, the, the SDL window that we're running within. So when we change scenes, we're changing scenes within that window. If you have a game where you need multiple windows up and running, I mean, good on you, but that's not really the normal situation. So uh, I have opted to keep my window inside the game manager Right now it's private though, so we need to make some functions to be able to get at that. And that's why we're having this problem here. So I might as well make a small job out of that. So let's let's just throw these in. Um, so um, I might as well, yeah, let's, let's drop in the first few things here. So, Right. So to begin with, um, these are really very simple. Um, as you can see, um, I'm basically just returning pointers to things. For, for get clock, I'm returning a clock pointer. For win get window, I'm returning a window pointer. Um, so since I have clock and window not as pointers in here, you will notice that I am referencing them using ampersand here to make sure that I get the pointer to clock and get the pointer to window. Um, of course, the compiler will complain if you don't do that, so that's what you should sort of expect. You, you would get something like this, this no suitable conversion function from window to window pointer. Um, so just make sure um, that you are using your referencing properly. I know that's something that takes a little bit of time to, uh, to remember uh, whether you're using asterisk or, or ampersand when to use them, but that's, that's one of those times. Um, and so now game manager, the rest of it is where we are going to move a lot of the game, uh, a lot of the code that has been handled in our sort of main loop here, sort of these, these functions that have done things like start load assets, update, unload assets, stop. I put this together previously to give you a fairly good impression of what a game loop sort of goes like. Now game manager is going to be the thing that is responsible for um, holding this game loop together now. Um, so what it's going to do is um, take on a few new functions. Now some of these have new names but basically what we've got here is begin game is very similar to start uh, out here where I mean you can see in fact just looking at the function signature that this thing is taking in that it's got width height start full screen like now I've got these SDL flags and image flags added on here so that you could modify these if you want to but you can see you know pixel width um, you know start full screen a lot of this stuff is at least kind of similar um, and so what we're going to do with begin game is very akin to what we're doing with start. <clears throat> so um, as usual, I have a constructor that, as you can see, just starts off with the scene being null. Um, begin game is effectively my init for game manager. So what this second game manager constructor is doing is just calling begin game. So um, I'm going to just drop these things into the CPP file. And I think probably this is going to get broken into sort of a two-parter. I realize that I've spent a lot of time talking about like kind of philosophical stuff, I suppose, in the sense of like, you know, what are, what are we all doing here? Um, but um, I, think, I think that that will work out. copy a few things into place One sec right so um, I'm just gonna leave the code into these end scene and end game functions 
so that you can see. But so begin game is going to be very much like start. Begin scene is actually quite a lot like our update loop. Um, it, in fact, is going to be the thing that contains the whole sort of update cycle. Um, so within the context of this, um, our, our main... Um, where does this go? It's a little bit similar to, to what our update function looks like, um, or it contains some of the same things. Um, and I'll show you that a little bit in a moment. But then, of course, end scene runs whenever um, a scene completes. Like, basically, how we had it before is that when update returns true, um, then it exits. The same basically will go for scenes, is that when, they, when their update returns true, that indicates that the scene is over and that we're going to, and we're going to end out of the scene. Um, and, of course, then, when we end game, <clears throat> That last function is basically exactly what stop looks like. It's the same thing. So you'll see there, end game is exactly what stop looks like. So I'm gonna I'm gonna copy a couple things into place. Where are we for time? 36 minutes? Not too bad. Okay, so I'm gonna try and keep this under an hour, but I want to get us to a point which is at least a decent stopping off point. So um, let's take a quick look at the things that start does. Because <clears throat> there's going to be a couple little changes to here. Um, but we're going to stick with this pretty closely. So I had this, um, this clock start down here in load assets, which is fine. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it into start because it could go there as well. So you'll notice here, so we do this stuff to initialize SDL, we do this texture filtering stuff, which I've mostly avoided describing. Um, we initialize the window, we create this MVP matrix, and then we initialize the, um, the SDL image plugin. And lastly, we start the clock. So if I were to move this just wholesale into um, Game Manager's begin game function, there's going to be a couple little problems to start with. Um, for one, we're not injecting a title in here. For now, I'm just going to call this SDL game. Uh, that can be set separately if you uh, if you want to. And I'm going to assume that the game does not start minimized because when does a game ever start minimized? That's silly. Um, now. Uh, see out, yes, that's true. We're going to have times where we need to be able to print things in here. Um, so I'm going to include a couple more things into here. So I'm going to add the includes for IO stream, uh, for string stream, and for SDL image because you guys know how I deal with errors, right? So it's always IO stream and SS stream in order to be able to um, put together like exceptions and to be able to print things if I need to print things. So game manager is basically going to be our top level thing that's responsible for printing to console if we really need to. For the most part, you should be able to avoid having to include IO stream throughout the rest of your application unless you really need it for debugging purposes somewhere. So you'll notice that including those things, pretty much all of our errors went away except for this MVP matrix stuff. And those of you who are remembering from before um, realize that this MVP matrix belongs to the scene now, which puts us in a different place. This, if you recall, do you remember seeing something like that within scene? There was a function, the scenes init, that would set something like this up. Oh, why is this having a problem? Window has no get width. Interesting. Give me one sec. Just double check on that. All right. Did I need to update my window class in order to contain that? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. That's all right. Um, okay, in my version, I have this encapsulated a little bit. Um, da -da -da. Sorry, I'll just fix this quickly. 
So in this version of the application that I am doing here, I didn't encapsulate my window stuff properly, but that's okay. This will do. That'll work. Okay, um, but yeah, so because this MVP matrix belongs to the scene, it's going to be the scene's responsibility to set up the camera in, in whatever way we need it set up or to set up the MVP matrix. So in its init, it's giving us a default view, and then later on we'll talk about how we can set it to whatever we ex whatever exactly we need it to be. Um, but that means it's gone from in here. Game manager doesn't own the MVP matrix. It's not the game manager's responsibility to deal with it. So that leaves us with begin game is basically start. It's pretty close, right? It's very similar to what we were looking at before. And then begin scene, um, that's, that is a, also a fairly beefy function in here. So um, let me see. There's certainly a few parts in here that you're going to recognize. Uh, let me try the big chunk first, and then we'll talk about adding a couple of little pieces to this. Right. This probably looks at least familiar. Um, yeah, i got to adjust the way to clock. Uh, so we're going to take delta seconds. And... I guess window is minimized, I think. Okay, good. Yeah, so this probably looks pretty familiar. This while loop that just checks, hey, are we quitting? No, okay, well then go get the SDL events, handle the quit event if necessary, pass the event to the window so that the window can handle events if it needs to. Then if there's a scene set, pass that to scene handle event. Huh, well, remember that scene had this thing so this is how our update loop is going to handle sending us sending us events so that we can handle them and we can update the game clock after we've handled events uh, we can um, so we can update the scene here do you remember from before um, let me see if I have code for that right here. Uh, da, 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 da. I don't think there's anything quite like it here, but we update. Yeah, okay, so all right, so we don't do anything quite like that. This line's probably a little bit confusing, but I want you to read this note. If scene update returns true, end the scene and quit the game after this frame renders. So um, remember that is quitting can get set by a whole bunch of things here. I'm assuming to start off with is quitting is false. And whenever is quitting gets set to true, this while loop is going to break. So if the quit message comes, or the quit event comes, we're setting is quitting to true. Um, in handle event here, um, Either of these sort of handling of events um, could theoretically set this on the game manager. Here, lastly, if scene update is called and update returns true back to me, what's going to happen here is that we have is quitting is whatever value it currently is. It could be either false or true. And if update comes back true, whatever is quitting is or true is true. Do you remember your Boolean logic or Boolean logic? You should really make sure that you you feel that and understand and and or really deeply because it's really, really useful to be able to do this. What this will do is it will, if for any reason scene update returns true, then is quitting gets set to true, but it won't accidentally overwrite a false um when there when is quitting was expecting to happen um like it won't is quitting won't get reset back to false if it was going to quit because of say the sdl quit event um so this is this is sort of useful here and then lastly if the window isn't minimized clear it if there's a scene to render render it and draw the window so that's that's all that is happening there so that's like basically the process of going through one one frame right that we handle events we let the scene do that 
we let the scene update, we let the scene render. And so there's a couple additional pieces that I want to sort of tack on to here is that when this while loop breaks, that means that the scene has ended, right? Like something has caused the scene to end. So we want to make sure that we call this end scene to like clean up the scene and make sure that it's finished. And we also want to add a couple of things onto the beginning here. Also, we want to make sure that if, if there is a scene that we end it um, to start with here, this is basically just to be sure that if we call begin scene without actually ending the previous scene, that whatever it is gets ended first. And then before we move on, we want to um, set whatever scene was passed in as the scene and call scene.begin. So now you'll see that all of these functions that are in here are being called in some way, shape, or form. So when our begin scene starts, like ignoring this first thing, um, we have scene.begin. So our begin code runs. Then we have handle event, and that's going to happen at every frame. So handle event just keeps getting called. And then if you remember, we had update and render also being called after that. So we got handle event, update, render, and these are all within this big while loop. So these things are getting called continuously as gameplay goes on. And then lastly, we have this end scene call, which ultimately is calling scene end. And that's our last function. So this game manager, when we call begin scene, this is managing the update, like the whole life cycle of our scene. This thing is, is going to hold all of that together for us and call all the functions that we need to get called. Um, so this game manager is looking pretty complete, I think, at this point. Uh, let me see what this build's like right now. Okay, so... So, oh yeah, okay. I need to get rid of that because image flags is defined separately because I just copied all this code from start, if you remember, so I must have missed that. Okay, so I have this thing building and I have so many files open. I'm gonna close a few of these, this is a little too much. Um, okay, so now, of course, if I were to run this, you're gonna see it does nothing differently because I have changed nothing in the main. Um, and unfortunately, because we're at about 46 minutes, I think I'm going to have to break this off and, um, and probably continue into this in the next lesson. But uh, what we have here is a fairly complete scene in a game manager, and these things piece together in a really useful way. Um, in the next lesson, we're going to go about bringing um, all of our sort of application-specific code here. Um, so all this stuff about gravity and like what textures we're loading and um, where they're positioned on screen and how we've set up the camera and all of that stuff, we're going to make a subclass of scene and we're going to um, bring those things into there um, so that uh, we can really isolate all the stuff that is about our application and separate it out from the stuff that we can reuse. And then secondly, we are going to um, change our main to turn it into something that looks like this. So um, the main changes a fair amount because right now we've got, you know, 200 lines of code in there um, and that's going to transform into something like this where when you look at it all that needs to happen is okay let's start up a game let's create a scene tell the game to run the scene cool finish the game let's exit and that's all it needs to do um, so as you can see there's gonna be a lot of work in sort of moving all this sort of important stuff about the way the game works into classes so that our main is freed up to do uh, very little and give us like a very very high level view of what's going on uh, inside this program So anyway, I think that's a pretty good stopping off point and um, I guess I'll see you in the next one